All right, hi Nick. Today we've got Nick Ward with us and he is a performance director with uh, Altus located out of uh, Lake Tahoe, California. Um, so Nick, I'm going to let you get started and introduce yourself. You can correct me on your title if there's been a change and uh, we can just take it from there. Yeah, thanks Lisa. It's, it's great to, to see you again after all this time. <laughs> you too. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've been working for Altis for four years, but uh, really it feels like 25, 30 years, um, really because of you know, my connection with Stuart McMillan and uh, Dan Path. Mm -hmm. Back in the mid-1990s mid when I uh, started my master's degree at the University of Calgary. And um, you, know, you come full circle many years later, and here I am, you know, working for Stu and, and for Kevin and, uh, and you know, with Dan and those guys. But I'm... No, I'm not directly related to the track and field stuff. Um, my expertise is that I'm uh, pretty average at a lot of things. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as a kind of program director, when they had the opportunity to develop a performance service line for Barton Health as part of a brand new integrated center for wellness, um, that they'd received some funding uh, from the lady they called the Angel of Tahoe, Lisa Maloff, uh, to build this center. And we were going to be one of the four pillars. So they have the orthopedics, um, the rehabilitation, the wellness and performance. And um, you know, Altis were selected to be that group to bring that together. And so I was recruited then from England to come over. And, uh, you know, my depth and breadth of my background, not just from a, you know, an understanding of Altis principles, but, um, you know, also from my broad experience across a number of sports and a number of different environments, but also the business aspect um, that I've done and developed as well, um, I guess made me the, the right person for the role. Cool. That sounds awesome. And so as a little um, background history, I met Nick when uh, he became uh, the Bobsleigh Canada Skeleton High Performance Director for, uh, it was about almost two years. Um, and it was all in that anticipated excited lead up to the 2010 olympics um so everybody had strong opinions on how things should go and who should be getting what for uh therapies modalities everything else as well so um nick came in along with Stu actually uh and came in with uh some very strong ideas of how best to set up a high performance training uh environment with athletes and this could be carried across to almost any environment, um, but it was more on creating and introducing that integrated support team. So you had your strength and conditioning coaches, you had your people who were specializing on speed, you had your massage and Cairo, your physiotherapist, and they were all working hand in hand with each other. So even to the point where we would have trackside therapy, uh, which now is like a massive thing that happens with all this, and it's really fun to watch because when you experience it firsthand, you see the benefit of it. So it could be that we're in a training session, our therapist is off to the side and they're noticing that the right leg isn't lifting as high. So let's go check the hip and be it we release the glute on the spot or we go and open up the hip flexor so that then you can have a better training session and then maximize your time on the field, but then also reduce the amount of time required off of the field in that preventative or rehabilitative um, position that most people get into. So I know your stance and I love how I was able to experience that because it helps set how I envision the growth and adaptation or really the evolution of uh, health and fitness for just general population as well because there's such a benefit to it. Do you wanna talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, I really started that with that approach back in the mid-90s when I was doing my master's degree in Calgary and uh, saw how, you know, Stuart was down by the track and, um, you know, he would be stretching people. Um, later on, I knew it was called ART. Um, but with Stu's role with, you know, Dan Path and Donovan Bailey and um, uh, Jeremy at the time were really sort of pushing and Mike Leahy and these guys were really promoting the ART side of stuff. And it was only one technique. Um, take that kind of full, full length now. I mean, the Altus Performance Therapy isn't really about any particular technique. It, it's about a coming together of professionals with their perspectives, 
looking at things through a variety of lenses to understand how we manage uh, both the health and the performance of the athletes, um, you know, to then to lead them on to, on to amazing athletic feats. So that, that's really the essence of it. It's, it's people coming together to, to, to think together, um, put you know, things to one side. You know, it's often it, we say, you know, who's the best person to manage this problem right now? Well, it's probably the person who's got the, the best answer or think we have the best answer and who's got the time uh, as well. And, you know, with, with bobsleigh kind of skeleton, you know, I had a budget. So you have all these people and that's often what happens when you have events like the Olympics, all the money floods in and no one really knows how to handle it all. Um, and I was living with the high performance director from Speedscaping at the time. And he's like, I don't need more money. <laughs> you know, he had what he needed. And we were quite influential with those guys, you know, with Gordon Bosworth and other people we brought in as well um, to support the health of the athlete. And, um, and it's, you know, how is it distinct from you know, sort of clinical physiotherapy? Um, you know, it's, it's not just about injury. It's not just about post-operative. Um, and that's why the definition moved on from trackside therapy to really be about, you know, who is in that team? Um, who, who can lend their perspective um, on, on managing the different phases with these athletes. So it's all, it's, it is all encompassing um, that just being about uh, hands-on work. Performance therapy might not be hands-on work. It might be a cue, yeah. you know? Um, but essentially it is, again, looking at the balance of um, interventions, whatever they might be, to promote an improved motor outcome from the athlete and as you said you experience that yourself something doesn't feel quite right when you're trying to do accelerations or whatever there's an intervention and again that intervention isn't always something physical nope. you know it could be a, a variety of different interventions so and part of that is then recognizing that you know one what fits one person might not fit another it, it's allowing for that individualization of the approach you know, we knew that in, 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 uh, in trying to enhance performance um, on competition days of the bobsled athletes, the skeleton athletes, something you'd do with one athlete one hour before, you know, for someone else <laughs> had to be done. Yeah, exactly. You know, so you, work you, the yeah, you kind of had to, to understand individual responses. And, you know, we found that there was an overabundance of soft tissue therapy, wasn't necessarily enhancing, could often deaden the athlete as well, but everyone loves a massage, right? Right. Uh, Almost. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we had to kind of, you know, figure those sort of things out too. And um, like I said, go right back to the beginning. For me, it was more of an introduction to ART and understanding how certain interventions <clears throat> can improve how the athlete's going to move. And if the athlete is still moving uncomfortably, um, or with any levels of discomfort, then you can plan B the session. It's okay to change the plan. And that's another part of Altus Performance Therapy um, is that, yes, it's a relationship between the athlete, the coach, and the therapist. But on the therapist side, you really got to broaden that out to the whole range of therapists, whether it be the strength conditioning coach, massage therapist, you know, whatever, that might work as part of that sports medicine, sports science team. Uh, being being kind of part of that equation because like essentially it comes down to who are the people who are with the athlete the most um, and who, who who might they might work with to get other information on on, on identifying the problem appropriately and then choosing strategies and whether it be acute it's just now and we want you to do you know shoulder work today yeah but my shoulder's sore at the front okay let's do x y and z it's still so okay let's leave shoulder work for three days then yeah. let's do something else today so I think that ability to pivot really and, and adapt the programming and get out of this mindset of no, it's on the piece of paper, it's on the spreadsheet, it's it's on the app. Yeah, <laughs> I've got to do it. It's like no, it's okay. Um, and I guess the other key aspect of it as well, as well as making sure the way we prep for the session, we're healthy enough to do that session, so we perform what it is we want to perform because that's what training is about, is to you know, create that next level up so we adapt. Um, it's also got to be representative of the movements you're trying to um, enhance in that sport as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that it's always, you know, from a, a weight room point of view, what's the, it's a means to an end. It's not about 
become a great weightlifter. It's what's weightlifting going to do to help me enhance yeah. the sport and, and, and just, yeah, just seeing things through different lenses and the lens of another professional that might give you another perspective on, on the appropriate intervention. So then how would you evolve that concept and that idea from a like high performing athlete type environment? We know they live in a very specific and different bubble. How would you go and evolve that into being more either like, you know, uh, weekend warrior types, uh, master weightlifters, powerlifters, or even just general population people who they still want to perform at the best that their body allows them to be knowing well that they're not in that upper echelon of athlete that I mean we you know we epitomize as being the best too um how would you translate that into general population so I was asked this question just the other day on on Altus's, uh performance therapy call uh seminar the other day I was yeah. on, on the on the chat and really what you've got to look at are, the, are, the, are those key principles it's about working with a team so who, who do we have on the team? Who we don't have on the team? What expertise do we or don't have available? Um, it's about being able to individualize for the athlete. What's the knowledge of the athlete? What's the knowledge of our staff? Where are the gaps in that? Um, so you've got to, you've got to um, look at the principles and then say, okay, if I'm a, a lone ranger in this, where, how do I create my network? Yeah. You know, what's my education on this? Uh, where are the gaps? So look at, the pieces of the principles and decide in my current environment right now, what can I emphasize? And probably, and again, I don't want to broad brush anything. Probably the number one thing you probably should emphasize is communication. Yes. Who do I talk to? Well, the first person you talk to is the athlete. Yes. And don't go in assuming you're going to tell them what they need. Yeah. Cause they come with their experience and their knowledge about themselves. So, Really, the first start point is, hey, what, why are you coming to Hub PT for? Yeah. You know? Um, oh, that's, that's great. You know, I really think we can really you know, work together on helping you achieve those goals, you know? Um, what, what is it that's so important about these things to you? Um, so a lot of this really comes from uh, the stages of change model, um, which uh, back in the mid-90s was kind of very new at the time. Yeah. Trans theoretical model it was also called um health coaching now has really adopted this approach quite a lot as well um and also because i've gone through motivational interviewing crucial conversation type stuff as well in my career and john barada's precision nutrition is great with that yeah. the level two course especially um too and you know I've, I've i've luckily i've been around professionals that helped me with that sort of stuff as well um you know, I think the, you, you've got to look at, look at what you can emphasize as part of that approach. If it's not going to be the hands-on therapy skills because it's out of your scope of practice, although, again, we could discuss that as well. <laughs> um, you know, I think probably the biggest advocate of self-management in these situations is Kelly Surrett, you know, yep. and what he's doing. Um, you know, I think he almost tries to take the physical therapist out of the equation by you know your body. Move. How does it feel? Oh, that doesn't feel as good. Are you intending to use that today in your workout? Yes, I am. Well, make it feel better before you start using it and loading it. Yeah. You know, and I think that's, we've got to keep it as simple as that. Um, and so um, I think looking at those kind of other tools and, and knowledge that's out there, so how someone can self-manage. So what I did was, we've all heard of FMS and screenings and you know, um, there's another whole story behind why I think physical therapy screenings became popular for, and I think it was very money driven. Um, and is that um, from that, who actually got the information about how their body moves and feels and the awareness? I don't think the athletes got much out of that type of screening, you know, uh, whereas go do a warm up. So for us, it was really, and I come up with what I call the magic six here at Barton, but it was really based off the 15 kind of initial uh, movements, trunk activation stuff that altists do, um, that the warm up became that person's own body scan. Do it consistently, do it regularly. You know, we do cat, camel, some hip rotation, downward dogs, 
variation of an Aldoa stretch. And from that, people really got an idea of how do my hips feel today? How does my back feel today? How are my shoulders feel today? How's my wrists feeling? How's my ankles feeling? So they could do a kind of a, their own kind of joint by joint assessment. What's their normal? Oh, that feels really good today. This is really bothering me today. So in essence, then we're able to then give them some activities to self-manage that um, rather than always be pick them up, put them on a table, you know? Um, so self-awareness, body scanning, I think is key. Yeah. Giving them some tools and strategies then to help that joint move smoother yeah. and better on that day. Being prepared then as a coach to modify and adapt that program on that day yeah. as well. Um, but one of the key differences, again, though, is that um, when you're, you know, me with my soccer teams, rugby teams back in England, I pretty much see them every single day. Yeah. And, I'm, and they all arrive at the same time. I'm in with all the coaches and the PT staff beforehand. So we're talking and players are sending in their digital online wellness scores and you're getting all that fun stuff. Yeah. Which for me, the 45 minutes before we hit the field, it was great that the physiotherapist chose to come into the warm up prior to the warm up rather than funnel everyone into their room. Yes. And one of the first things we changed was that that physio room, you're only there if the physio tells you you've got to be there. Mm -hmm. You don't just turn up. Otherwise, you're over here with me. And there's a big process of education with the rugby players. And it was like, oh, this stuff actually works. I feel better. I move better. Rather than it always be about being in that PT room. But when you, you know, when you um, don't, don't have that kind of resource at your fingertips, you have to think a little bit differently. So it is about teaching your clients those strategies um, to help them move a lot better um, yeah. and, and really build that into the process. So we spend a lot of time initially, which doesn't help if you've got clients who just want to come in and sweat and get beat up, right? Yeah. But you've got, you got to decide what you want to be. Do you want to create healthy clients that can do that and you explain that process to them that we're going to spend a little bit of time deconstructing to reconstruct and you know you need to um would like you to be invested in that process because it's really important the feedback you give us so we spend the first week two weeks really doing that now you know everyone likes to sweat still right? oh, totally. so yeah, well. you know what why were finishers invented for yeah. but to give people you know finishers that are sensible around the way their body moves um, and then you can start filling the middle bits in, you know, get them warming up and prepping properly, understand how to scan their body, be healthy, look after their body's joints, give them some cardio and core stuff over here, which are pretty easy winners. Yeah. You know, most people shouldn't really be getting hurt from cardio and core. And then that strength and that dynamic stuff all in the middle there, start figuring out, you know, what's the, the kind of the shapes, you know, uh, the patterns. Uh, and the kind of power you want people to express in those and really it's that middle bit that becomes that progressive program uh, over time I think. And see and I love this because it can tell that you're you're super passionate about sharing what you know and you're super passionate about educating in the entire process and that was another thing I picked up with working with you as well as an athlete was that education for the athlete to learn about themselves was so important and I mean, there's always groups that don't buy in and then there's groups that buy in and then there's ones that like jump all the way in right away. And um, it was, it's really fun being able to watch those groups of people and then trying to learn how the coaches or the, um, the leaders within the pack kind of start encouraging the ones that don't buy in to start understanding it a little bit further too. Um, and then like for us at the hub, we definitely... Um, we would have a monthly movement prep that touches on major joints, major movements, foundational requirements, and a whole bunch of like physiotherapy exercises that we all should do, but we just totally avoid. Um, and so we incorporate those as like the educational element because everybody does it every time they come in prior to the workout. And, um, and then they start realizing like, oh, my shoulder's really unhappy. I'm like, okay, we're not overhead pressing today. What else are we going to do instead, right? Why is it unhappy? Mm -hmm. What were you doing before you came here? Those types of things. And then it starts allowing that conversation to come versus um, to like, I guess the detriment a little bit with general population physical fitness is sometimes we just like funnel them in 
they do what we plan. There's no um, alternative workout, and it is what it is. And if they're most people in that type of environment actually don't feel safe or comfortable to express how they're feeling in the first place, so they just push through. Or because they haven't had the opportunity to have that education, they think that that discomfort is normal and that it's mm -hmm. an okay thing to be feeling. And um, so that's that extreme passion that you have on that education process that you have with the people you come across is, is truly enlightening. And I really, truly hope that it can expand beyond um, and into every aspect of our fitness world that's out there as well. So that then you get a better appreciation of, of every single person and how you might have a plan, but like you said, it's not going to be the same thing every day. And it certainly won't be the same plan for every person either. Yeah, you make a good point there because um, everyone's going to have their own comfort level uh, with this. And you know, one of the balances I had when I first came to Barton, there was a class program, but then we were having our performance program. And so as we merged the two together, and so it was really helpful when people in that class were also on the performance program because, you know, they knew the adaptations. Okay, let's not do this, do it this way. And I think even as a class instructor, you have to be prepared to know, know what lateralizations or regressions you need to give someone. The simplest one is pick a lighter weight. Yes. <laughs> and, that's, and, that's, and that's an ego thing, right? Oh, uh, or, or rather rebound the jumps, just hold the jump. Yeah. Have a low, you know, it's, it's the intensity side is the bit that's the easiest thing for us to kind of, because I think part of it is our job to also Get people excited about the skill of movement, yes. not just about the physical demand of it. Um, and again, that is different. General pop who haven't got a sport recreational goal just want to leave feeling good a lot of the time, right? And I burnt my calories and my heart rate was in this zone. And again, that's okay, right? If that's what they're leaving with, but make sure they're healthy. Yeah. Um, and maybe leave them with a problem to solve for the next time they come back. Um, as well so we we merged the group and the performance coaching together quite well and those people that weren't in the performance program that were just in group you know were kind of curious then and some of them might only join the performance program for three months to learn some stuff and then they'll be back into the class-based program but that's okay too they're wiser still right they still walked back into the class base with greater yeah. knowledge so they are probably thinking about what they were doing in that class without having to rely on a trainer to stop them and change what they're doing too. Yeah, and I think one of the other things I wanted to make a point on, and we, we talk of this a lot about athletes, and you will know, is that sometimes I want you to be educated on what we're doing, purely for you to turn around and say, Nick, I don't want an explanation, I trust you, just get yes. me to do it. Yes. You know, so that, that's fine as well. It's that kind of who holds the power, for want of a better word, and what is the relationship? So, um, you know, you, you don't want to have all the information, but you know enough now that you just trust us. Yep. You know, yeah. uh, but where there's other athletes that are the big executive thinkers that want all the information, yeah. which is great on the one hand, but for some of them, it completely messes them up because they start overthinking things yeah. as well. Um, uh, so there's all that balance to be had, and that's just the coach-athlete, coach-client relationship, which, you know, at some point, what are you, as my client, giving me permission to do? Mm -hmm. You know, what are you allowing me to do? And as coaches, we, we have to have a broader skill set now, I think, to, to work with our clients in, 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 in different adaptable ways, even to the point where, some people might think this is really weird, but I honestly feel certain people can have, can have connections to different types of exercises. Oh, completely. As long as, yeah, as long as the principle of movement is in that exercise, that I look at someone, they see a barbell, they, they look scared. Yeah. I give them a ke kettlebell or a band, they're really happy. Yeah. I'm giving them the same exercise, yeah. you know? Yeah, or even just a band with a resistance band on it. And it's like, yeah. it's the same thing in the end. Yeah. yeah. So I think there is a, that, a, a level of knowing your clients to see what they want to connect with. And it's just first steps, right? Give them that hook, get them connected. Don't try and, and, I, and I've been guilty of this, give them 
way too much to start with. So <laughs> my staff always, always laugh at my rule of three, yeah. you know? Um, you know, if, if you work on three key areas for one exercise, or you work on one key area with three exercises, mm -hmm. and that's about as much as the brain can take to learn any one test. You might give them loads of other stuff, but when they come back next time, how much have they actually learned and remembered? One thing. And that's part, yeah, that's it. One thing. There's your building block. There's the start of your scaffold. You know, how do you start building that scaffold up? So I think there's an art in, um, in, in building that personal plan as well, not overburdening. And the rule of three, I find, comes in really, really well. Uh, yeah. Because our mental capacity to take on it anymore is just too limited. Yeah, no, I agree with that completely. I know for me, it's uh, the rule of three hits and then they start doing and then without even realizing it, you start like putting in more points, more points. You're like, oh, wait, scale it back. <laughs> Gotta go back. And it's hard because you get excited because you as the practitioner, the trainer has seen the movement so many times and you have you have those eyes to identify where something isn't working not moving quite so well whatever the case may be that like you know the answer but half the time you have to allow them to physically find out the answer as well absolutely and i think that's both you know in our use of metaphor analogy when we coach versus technical input and you know, um, Nick Winkleman's just brought his book out and there's a lot of stuff there, obviously, about the, the art of language. Mm -hmm. But he's not saying don't use technical cues. Yeah. You know, he's not saying that. He's just because there's a, there's a place for all types of cueing and feedback yeah. in what we do. I mean, you know, uh, I don't like having mirrors in my facilities, but at times a mirror can be really useful yeah. as a part of feedback for someone. They might need that as well. Um, there's definitely a, 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 an art side to how you position time and the type and quality of cue that you use. And really one of the most simplest and, and age old methods of training that we have does it brilliantly for us. It's called circuit training. But don't put 12 exercises together, put no. three exercises together, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> because although they, oh, I'm really struggling on my squat technique, we can go and spend the next 30 minutes on squat technique and they'll still be rubbish next time they come back. Yeah. For you, give them that chance to move around. What's that called? It's variety of practice, it's contextual interference, you know? So, you know, maybe a, a squat with a, with a hip hinge with something else, that's an upper body exercise. So you have two that might assist each other. The third one that's out of the picture because you don't want them overthinking it. And we know from some of the brain science, if, if people are staring at the thing they want to move better, it doesn't create the best fast and learning connections in the head. So you've got to make it more skill focused, challenge focused, and not so technically driven. Um, so yeah, it, it's something which where how you decide to structure your class can create a wonderful learning environment if you just spend a little bit of time thinking about that. And one of the things I would do is, hey, Lisa, you just did that exercise. Tell Kate how to do it now. Yeah, that's always you fun, know? letting the student become the teacher and watching them. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I figured it out. <laughs> yeah, you did. You knew it all along. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a danger in that as well. That person then overcomplicates it. A right? little bit. You're, but... You're, 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 yeah, but you're figuring that out within your group, especially if your groups are regulars yes. as well, that you're seeing. That, that's kind of cool to give them that. And you'll kind of start seeing who are good at it. So yeah. next time, after 10 minutes, that person's still explaining, you make sure you don't do that again. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let the people who are talkers just keep doing their thing and let the shy people do the instruction. They'll be done in two yeah. words. Life's good. Yeah, yeah. No, that's it. good. Um, so moving forward, uh, where do you envision the fitness world post? Like right now we're stuck in this pandemic purgatory um but where do you envision the like even for sport training for high performance athletes because a lot of things are going to be greatly affected the olympics are being pushed forward another year i mean no coach has ever uh trained a five-year quadrennial <laughs> or coached mm -hmm. a quadrennial in five years um so this is new for everybody and i know in the the zoom call with kelly start he uh he basically mentioned how Zeus, or Stu mcmillan was like we just start again just start all over and it's like okay fine but things are changing and things will be changed even the psyche mm -hmm. of our of, of human nature is going to be shifted and changed after this as well so where do you envision things going or where do you hope things can go 
Um, I, I, the hope again is that the education piece just mm -hmm. gets further emphasized. You know, I agree. Uh, you know, I don't want mindless clients just going into you know high intensity sessions where they don't have to think. And I, I got told a lot here. Ah, oh, people just don't want to think. They just want to be told what to do. Mm. Okay, I, I get that to a point, but I get it. it it's that choice I'm giving them. That now we've spoke about it, you're just going to get on and do what I've said. So I know there's some kind of intent, some level of cognition there, some handing over of that authority, if you like, to get them to do this. But build that appraisement at the end. I think the other side of it as well, we, work, we are going to spend time, um, especially from the altered performance therapy perspective. And, um, you know, we talk a lot on the altered performance therapy course, uh, you know, about relationships and about critical thinking observational techniques so that course isn't just about um i think calling it therapy may put a lot of people off but it's for every coach out there you know to understand how you can be part of this this, this dynamic approach to to managing complex problems and you know it will it will um observation is a key part of that but we're so used to observing in around different angles maybe feeling what something's like watching them in the field we might have to get better observing as we are here right now yeah. over camera in two dimensional, mm -hmm. you know, and, and doing more of this. Mm -hmm. Now track and field, as we know, is a, is a very highly dense coach sport. I've worked in golf and I've worked with, with skiers. I, so I, there's a, some of us out there that are used to doing this kind of remote stuff. And again, it's boundless of acceptability. Are you happy that this is all you can do? Yeah. And therefore, how do you, get the athlete to trust those wellness questionnaires, that feedback, be better at completing their logs, their diaries, which we all know <laughs> compliance isn't great with those things. Yeah. But the, just the art of having a good conversation um, to help us with decisions and make some better judgments over training programs. So I think, you know, the, the apps, the wearable apps, all those things uh, is going to uh, really uh, grow um, from this. Um, I think the understanding of mental performance is really going to grow out of this as well. Um, a lot of people, you know, have got, would have found this very, very challenging. Um, in terms of athlete groups, um, if you believe that this may return year after year, how do we cycle groups around? Uh, you know, so much for training at the same time in the morning. Um, what I forgot to mention earlier, of course, in our general population groups, they come in at any time throughout the day, yeah. right? We don't have this nice little block of time where we can get around everyone. Our, our time as coaches in the general population is scattered all over the Split place, shifts, right? everything, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So our, our clientele, their scheduling, how they work, you know, I think there'll be a lot more focus. And, and I think it's already there, but I think there'll be a lot more focus on the recovery regeneration side, uh, mental health side. Uh, is going to be big and the nutrition component and you know train well eat well restore well uh, was my kind of three principled philosophy that I, I really started pushing a lot more in the UK before I came here uh, but it is having that more holistic approach so as, as coaches as trainers um, we're going to be more generalist yeah. you know that we are going to have to have more than one string to our bow and that's where the scope of practice thing comes in a little bit um, and I think we do have to offer more to our clients, recognizing we're, a, we're more of an interdisciplinary coach going forward, but we have those people in our network we can bring in should we need to, and maybe be a little bit, bit, bit more collaborative around the business model and the finances of that, rather than I'm the specialist stuck in my silo here and you can only access me through insurance. How do we start thinking a little bit differently business-wise mm -hmm. to really collaborate and not being rivals for each other's clients? You know, um, I'll give you a practical example of that. In the town here right now, you can pay $10, $10 a month to go and train in a place. Mm -hmm. um, good. Who's writing your program? Who's, who's coaching you? Who's looking after you? So maybe people start doing more online training, doing more at a cheaper facility because money and stuff, you know, may be more different for people. But I think we, me as a coach, I could say, hey, yeah, fly into where I am for two weeks, I'll spend two weeks with you, then I'll set you up on your online program and we'll, you know, online coach for a bit. Or, but you know, you're in my same town, you know, 
Um, look, Lisa's a fantastic coach. She's got a great program there. I think her schedule and facility is going to fit you better than me. Um, but I'm the lead coach. Yeah. I'm going to send them with the program. What that does for you and me, it gives I've us learned. a collaborative relationship where we learn off each other. It becomes symbiotic as well. So you, you're going to respect that, that I'm leading on that program, but I'm going to trust your eyes and your feedback. And that becomes a, a model of maybe of working. Yeah. There's financials in all this, but I think that's possible if people are truly collaborative. Yeah. And sometimes it's going to be let people go uh, to yeah. other places and they come back or, or whatever. So, so it's going to be challenging. The physical contact side, the space side, um, our mass gyms going to be a thing of the past or the anytime fitnesses or those things with the big, you know, um, even my colleagues here, What's the return to business plan look like right now? And if there's four things you've got to work on. What's the acute now? Yeah. You know, what's the acute next? You know, what's going to be then the chronic medium term stuff you need to build towards? If you're not very skilled in online coaching right now, start working on it. Understand technology platforms. Uh, but then what's, what's the bigger vision uh, for all this as well? And um, some people... Uh, I worry that they think they're going to go back to exactly how it was before. Yeah. And uh, I think I saw a quote yesterday, just because you climb the first mountain doesn't mean you can climb the second in the same way. Yeah. You're uh, going to need a different I, tool. I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like um, we're quite on par on what the future may hold in terms of, you know, the way, especially our industry, because it is very much like, it, it traditionally has been very much like touch time, face-to-face -face contact. I mean, even for me, coaching my Olympic weightlifters is like a significant challenge because I may not see what their feet are doing, but I get to see what their hips through to their arms are doing by way of just really not knowing how to set up a camera. So it's like, you have to kind of play guessing games a little bit, or, you know, today we're going to watch your feet. So make sure your camera's at your feet tomorrow. I'm going to watch mm -hmm. your, you know, we're going to change yeah. it this time. So yeah, it's getting super creative for sure. Mm -hmm. And I do agree trying to get out there and educate and learn something else that's going to be complementary to what you do. And if not building that support system around you that you can then refer out to those people and have a, constant communication back and forth with those people not just they're not my problem anymore i'll see them in the gym and we won't worry about what that practitioner did with them because that's not my issue it is your issue you need to know that as well so yeah. well, well i i don't know if you've thought about this but let's say within your community there's only a certain amount of people that might be accessing all the different gyms and facilities in your community and John Barad has done a really good thing in his, in his book, Change Makers, where he shows that chasm. You're over here saying, hey, we're over here. We've got all this great stuff. And there's these people over here going, oh, I need to get fitter. I need to get healthier. I don't know who to turn to. Hey, we're over here. I don't know where to go. Hey, we're over here. I don't know where to go. <laughs> and there's this chasm, right? It's how do we, you know, Creative how we do that? We do that collectively. And so even within a community, the community health, the number of people you could get to, the different uh, languages that might be in your communities, you know, the different uh, demographics, young, old. Um, if you actually all get together, you could actually increase the pool of people that might want your guy's service as well, rather than all fighting over the last bit of that pumpkin pie, yeah. you know? Uh, also, I think um, from a marketing and PR perspective, Look, newspapers are suffering. All those, all those people are suffering out there, right, as well. So, and they're all going to want to come back and get your business, but you can't afford it. So why not cr come together collectively as an alliance or something like that as well, where you say, look, we all can't individually start competing with each other out there. Let's, let's promote this as a community alliance of health and fitness professionals. Because ultimately, it's going to be down to the individual with where they feel they connect the best. Yeah. You know, create a marketplace opportunity where, hey, for one month every year, everyone gets to go to everyone else's place mm -hmm. and, and check it out, see how it feels, yeah. you know, uh, as well. Um, and I really think that marketplace options are a good way to go in a community where uh, um, if you all start competing against each other again, you know, um, okay, it might be great that you're the one that survives, but are you stronger for it? No. Um, you know, so something to think about.
No, I appreciate that. Yeah. So we created um, like a summit in essence, um, not really like an active summit, but a, a place on Facebook as it stands right now for whoever within High River that are prepared and ready to be involved in that group of health, fitness and wellness practitioners, um, you know, life coaches, uh, uh, massage, um, an NKT, um, yoga instructors, myself, a bunch of other people as well. And we're all, you know, in there trying to help, help make it one spot for people to become aware. But I sense a lot of people are still very much in that like survival mode and they're not quite mm -hmm. open to seeing the bigger picture yet on how we can expand beyond that. So my hope is that over time we can start creating this. And this is one reason why we have the industry interviews is because I'm interviewing local practitioners as well so that they can just talk about what they do and people can get a sense of them and their personality from here through this yeah. um, avenue being online. And, um, and then just be like, you know what, I really like what Sarah said about uh, ear seeds and how it can help with my stress levels. I'm going to go and ask her more questions now. And it's like your opportunity to just educate a little bit further, like continuing ed, um, but more so for general population than for just the professionals who are in there because we're all seeking continuing ed as it, as it is. But perhaps our community needs that education to know like, hey, there's a tea, like literally all I have to do is drink a tea that's going to help me reset some of my anxiety levels. Sign me up, right? So it's being able to find those resources and just having avenues to be able to put them out there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's great. I think that's uh, definitely a way to keep moving forward with, right? I think yeah. that's, um, I'm, I'm a bit of a lover of, histo of history. So, you know, after many different catastrophes and stuff like that how did how did communities survive they got together yeah you know and you know it was by coming together that they they were able to share resources extend resources to others save resources um and you know uh, and then together kind of choose the shape and direction the pace of their regrowth uh, mm -hmm. as well and it's interesting it really makes you decide what's really important yes yep. i think as well and one thing is after this people might decide that spending money on a trainer or a coach isn't important they might. you know so how do you keep humming along with that level of education for them still yeah. you know if anyone decides to leave any of your your clients or anyone in your network someone leaves them say thank you yeah. keep the door open you know make sure they know that's a great decision for them um, and as you said, keep communicating with them, whether it be a community wide newsletter or something like that, that, you know, keeps going on and that they're still welcome. Um, because making that decision, there's reasons they made that for them. That's not going to be easy for them. You yeah. know, uh, they, don't, they don't need to be feel bad about it oh. as, as well. Right. Um, yeah. And that, that's the main thing that you, you, you can, you're continually that, quite a little hum of support in the background for them yeah. and when they're ready again they can come back with no anxieties about it yeah yeah absolutely absolutely totally agree and then it's also like treat people the way you want to be treated in the grand scheme treat people the way you would like to be treated in whatever situation you might end up in as well right so yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. yeah well nick i want to say thank you so much i really really appreciate you taking <laughs> time to do this and I asked, I appreciate you said actually putting the little um, birdie in my ear suggesting something along this lines as well um, this was the best way I could figure out how to take some education that our local practitioners have and share it with everybody and uh, had it not been for you reaching out and suggesting something like this it wouldn't have happened so I really do want to say thank you very much um, and and let you know that I I I'm still a huge fan, even though we're like 10 years, 12 years removed um, from me being an athlete and <laughs> you being the uh, high performance director. But um, it's always fun watching your journey as well and seeing you. how you're able to influence other people throughout your life as well. And I really, I, I love watching that and learning from you because I am still learning from you too. So thank you very much. Appreciate it, Lisa. Lovely to see you again. Yes, you too.